Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. I'm excited to welcome you to a great conversation tonight between John List and Steve Levitt. FAN's a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 175 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. For introductions, John List is the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. His research includes over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and several published textbooks and focuses on combining field experiments with economic theory to deepen our understanding of the economic science. In the early 1990s, Professor List pioneered field experiments as a methodology for testing behavioral theories and learning about behavioral principles that are shared across different domains. He has collaborated with several different schools and charities, as well as firms including Lyft, Uber, United Airlines, Virgin Airlines, Humana, Facebook, Google, General Motors, Tinder, Citadel, Walmart, and several nonprofits. Stephen Levitt is the William B. Ogden Distinguished Professor of Economics at the U of C. He is the co-founder of the Center for Radical Innovation for Social Change, and he directs the Becker Friedman Institute's Price Theory Initiative. Professor Levitt co-authored Freakonomics with Stephen Dubner, which spent over two years on the New York Times bestseller list and has sold more than 5 million copies worldwide. He is the co-author of the popular Freakonomics blog and hosts the weekly podcast, People I Mostly Admire, winner of Adweek's Best Interview Podcast of 2021. In 2004, Levitt was awarded the John Bates Clark Medal, awarded to the most influential economist under the age of 40. How lucky are we? Let's welcome John List and Steve Levitt. Thank you. Lonnie, thank you so much. All right, John. So that was a nice introduction of you, but it didn't really do justice to the true you. Um, <laughs> I think what it missed is the fact that you are one of the most prolific, incited, and influential and innovative economists on the planet. And for the last 20 years, I have been telling everyone I, I meet that you are the young economist most likely to win the Nobel Prize. And the mm -hmm. only correction I think I need to make to that after 20 years is we're not, neither of us are so young anymore. <laughs> but, uh, I still think, uh, I still would say you're the, uh, of the, of, of economists of our age who are the most likely to win the Nobel Prize. So, uh, no, that's, um, I mean, feelings are mutual. That's so kind of you. For everyone on the call, Steve is the main reason why I moved to the University of Chicago in 2005. And um, Steve and I have worked together ever since. And um, we both work together and play together. So it's, it's um, such a privilege to talk to you tonight about the book, Steve. All right, I'll tell a quick story about, so when, I was at Chicago before John, and um, he was at the University of Maryland in the agricultural economic department. So not exactly high status within the world of, of economics, but he was an amazing economist. It was obvious. And so I, I had never met him, but I, I just called him out of the blue and said, hey, I've just been reading your papers. I'd like to try to get you an offer at the University of Chicago, but it's it's a lot of work to get an offer. So I would just like to have a sense of if I can get you an offer, you think you would consider taking it? And John, you said, well, if you give me an offer, I will take it, okay? So I went through and I, I bailed some of my colleagues who were not quite as visionary as I was, uh, and we got John an offer, but it also, it, 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 somehow no, the, 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 you know, the, the elites within economics hadn't noticed John, but as soon as we made an offer, they actually looked at his CV and they said, my God, we need this guy. So Princeton ended up making an offer too. So it turned out Princeton made John a much better offer than we did at U of C. John's wife at the time wanted to go to Princeton. John wanted to go to Princeton. And um, so it was totally obvious he should go to Princeton. So I just called John up and I said, look, I know you said to me, if I got you an offer, you'd come to the U of C, but I am officially letting you off the hook for that because it is so totally clear that you have a better offer from Princeton that no one in their right mind will come to the U of C. But John, you said, like, it was interesting. You said, no, I'm a man of my word. I'm going to come to the UFC. I said, no, no, you don't have to. I've, I, I've let you off. But, but you did that. And I think that really says a lot about the kind of person that you are. I've, I've known you to be very loyal and um, honest and um, truthful in a way that very few people are. So anyway, that's no, I uh, want to I want to add to that. So, Steve, you're you're 100 percent right. Um, there was no way I was going to back off. 
with the promise, but it was even better because by that time, I think I had eight offers that were better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was across the board. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, but no, look, it was, it was both you're developing friendship, you're developing co-authorship. People on the call here don't know how hard it is to get a senior offer in our, out of our department. So, so that meant a lot to me too, but uh, your word is your word. So I'm, um, I've never looked back. I've been super happy at University of Chicago. Okay, so this is your second popular book. The first was The Why Effect that you wrote with Yuri Genizzi. And I have to be honest with you, this book is about a thousand times better than the first book. And, and the reason I say that is because the first book was about your research, but there was like, it, it didn't capture you, you know, your spirit and your outlook. Um, and and what I loved about this book, it was just, a, I mean, you have a unique personality and you put that into the book. Was that intentional that you wrote this one very differently than the first one? No, thanks. That's a good question. And I'm, that just proves to me that you have read it. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that's right. I, I think that I viewed this more of a, a discussion about what I view as my mission in economics and what I'm about and, and what I've done where the first book felt to me more like a here's why people should do field experiments and it was more descriptive about the work and it was less about the heart mm -hmm. and, and about how we should be using economic science to change the world and, and I thought that the way that this book came about it was really from our work in a way we for all, all of those who don't know Steve and I and Roland Fryer started a pre-K program in Chicago Heights that opened up in 2010. It was, it was soup to nuts, what we produced. And after a few years, we got great results. So when we took those results to policymakers, this was more me than Steve and Roland, they were busy doing other things. Um, the policymakers pretty much said those results won't scale or that program will, will not scale. And at that moment, I reflected on my career because my career had been from the early 90s using the world as my lab and trying to figure out how economics can help us understand the world. Most of the people on this, on this call have probably been an experimental subject of mine without <laughs> knowing it, for, for better or worse. It's not creepy in that I can link your name or your identity to a behavior. It's not creepy like that. It's um, it's creepy in the sense that when we raise prices at Lyft by 10%, I know that people take 5% fewer trips. People like us, that, that's, that's in a sense the, the creepiness. But at, at this moment then when the policymaker said, this won't scale, um, this became important to me is not only a pursuit in research, but also a pursuit in trying to make the world a better place and learn about why people don't think it will scale. So I'm glad that that came out in the book because most of the time you hear people say it's a labor of love, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think when people look at the pages, they're going to see that it's a labor of love and it, it's about my uh, trials and travails in the field. Yeah, I do think I, I mean, there, there are a million books and um, and the ones that are good are the authentic ones. And and I think this is a for me, at least just having known you for a long time, this came off as very authentic. OK, yeah, but yeah. before we get ahead of ourselves, just so we're on the same page, what what in the world do you mean by the phrase the voltage effect? Yeah, what is the voltage? Effect? <laughs> <laughs> so so I want people to think about the voltage effect as what happens in the small might be different than what happens in the large. So if we do a pilot, say in Chicago Heights, we set up a pre-K program in Chicago Heights. If we want to scale that, and what I mean by scale is take it from Chicago Heights to Denver or to LA or to Washington DC. The way I think about that is horizontal scaling. You wanna scale it across markets. And we also might want to think about vertically scaling it. So instead of one pre-K in Chicago, we have 20,000 pre-Ks in Chicago. So the voltage effect speaks to 
how the impact from your program will change when you scale it both horizontally and vertically. And that's why I titled it the voltage effect because it's sort of like in economics, we have laws. We have the law of demand, we have the law of supply. I think the voltage effect is as close to a law as what I see in economics because the impact nearly every time changes when you move from the small to the large. So, okay, that all makes sense. I still don't understand why you called it the voltage effect. There must be something well, why did I call it about that? electricity that I don't understand about. Yeah, it was should be wattage, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, what it was. Okay, but now explain why, because I think you're yeah, operating exactly. at a level that's like one above my, one over my yeah. head about why you call it that. Yeah, like if we're honest, it should be wattage, right? But um, <laughs> so, so when you think about it, you could call this book the scale up effect. So, so Dana Suskind and I, who's who's going to be here April 28th, a, a little plug for my wonderful partner, Dana. Um, she and I have an edited book that's titled Scale Up Effect. So you can imagine when, when I think of scale up, it's when you go from the small to the large, what happens? You're scaling things up. I, I wanted the title to be more active. And I wanted the title to be about something concerning the program's results or how could we envision the program results changing if we set up the program correctly. I think about high wattage at scale or, or big voltage rather than the actual act of doing it. I wanted to think about the actual results and the impact and how that changes. But, but let me back off and be clear. There are three major parts of writing a book. The easiest part is writing it. The second easiest is figuring out a title. And the third is getting people to read it. And that, that's really super hard because nobody, nobody wants to buy and read the book. So, um, but, but that's, uh, that, that's really how I got to the voltage effect. Okay, so um, the basic structure of the book is you talk about five reasons why small scale projects don't scale. Okay, and then you talk about four reasons how you can supercharge a, a small scale project. So how about, let's just start with, uh, I mean, it's, I, I think stories are better than theory. So um, how about you just tell me a story? What's your biggest scaling success? Uh, well, success, I've had very few successes. Oh, um, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. You're just saying that, come on. Um, I, I, I'm out I, of no, you have, you've had, uh, obviously working at Lyft and Uber, you've had an incredible, yeah, yeah, I, I, would I, I would probably say the products. So, so on the one hand, it's probably the products that we've developed at, at Uber. I was in charge of rolling out tipping and, and I thought that that scaled reasonably well. Now where the, where it had scaling issues is in the small, when we only did the we started at the, the beginning. Okay. So I think it's a good story. So start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, let's start from the beginning. you in the book that I think is really an awesome story. Yeah, so yeah. Uber, so, Uber exists, like Uber's existence, like let me go back because it's hard for people to remember. Uber yeah. came in and people loved it because you used to have to pay taxi cabs. You had to like have exact pay cash and tip the guy. And Uber came along and didn't have any tips. He just got in the car, he left, and, and people liked that. Okay, But there came a moment I think because Lyft had tipping, right? And that was Absolutely. creating a real problem along the way. Okay, so you are the chief economist at Uber. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's you, turn okay, then what clock. happens? Yeah, let's turn back the clock. Okay. Let's turn back the clock. So April 27th of 2017, President Trump issues an executive order. That evening, people went nuts. It was an executive order on immigration. So people go nuts and... Taxi cab drivers around JFK go on strike. So Uber's typical response when there's a market shakeup is to turn off surge. For all of you who haven't used Uber before, surge is what happens when there's so much demand that there are no cars around that they automatically raise price in an attempt to clear the market. So Uber does that and they thought they were doing something good what in fact happened, however, was there was a cabbie who took offense to that and he writes a tweet that says, hashtag delete Uber. Okay, that tweet 
changed the landscape of rideshare as we know it. Because back then, as you said, I was a chief economist back then, Lyft was literally waving the white flag. They had like five or 7% of market across the United States. They were, we were killing them. But now all of a sudden, you know, Travis did a few other things besides the, this, you know, Travis Kalanick, the founder was doing some, some things which we're all gonna learn about on, on Super Pump, the, the new Netflix show. But um, drivers and customers went nuts. And, and they grabbed on to that delete Uber. And Travis came to my team. My team at Uber was called Ubernomics after, after Steve Book in a way. And I had, I had about 10 people at Uber. And Travis said, John, your job is to get the drivers back. And I had talked to enough drivers by this time that they wanted one thing. They wanted tipping. And they wanted tipping because they thought that if we put tipping in the app, that they would make a lot more money. Okay. So you might remember though, at this point, customers were getting a little bit angry because drivers would put tin cans in the back seat and they would say, give me a tip before you leave the car. So customers were beginning to say, we want tipping too. Okay, great. So we tried it out in a few markets. We gave 5% of drivers the chance to receive tips in the app. Guess what happened? They made more money, they worked more. Everyone's better off. Guess what happened when we rolled it out to everyone? Well, when all drivers get it, they all worked a little bit more, but because there was so many drivers out there, it outstripped demand and drivers would drive around with empty cars more often. So what happened was they undid all of the good stuff from the tip effect in that they made exactly the same amount of money after tipping as they were making before tipping. So that's sort of a scaling success and failure. It was a success in that we rolled it out just fine. The drivers loved it, the customers loved it, but it didn't do one of the things that we had hoped and that's increased driver wages. And that's why that's one of the five vital signs in the book. I talk about the spillovers in markets tend to be very important. And we, we could see that that was gonna happen, but we didn't know exactly how far it would go. We didn't know exactly that it would undo the whole effect like it did. Yeah, okay. And so you must have some real disasters too. I mean, what's the worst? <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst failure, Scott? And, and I, I presume this, look, part of the reason you're writing the book is yeah. because you learn stuff along the way. So uh, tell me about your worst failure that you've ever had. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pick on, on our study a little bit, our mm -hmm. Chicago Heights study. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned before, Steve and I and Roland Fryer started a program for three, four, and five-year-olds in Chicago Heights. And that program included a component where the children would come in for 10 months a year and they would go to school all day, start at 9.30 in the morning, go to 3.30 in the afternoon. We also had a program for their parents and their parents ran through what we called a parent academy. However, to get parents to agree to be part of it, we had to pay them. We had to pay them for their attendance. Okay, so now when we try to scale, horizontally scale the parent academy, we tried to scale it to London and we told people there that we need to pay parents to get them to participate. They said, we can't local regulations in our jurisdiction says we cannot pay parents, but we can have you give them the great stuff. And we said it won't work because they won't show up. We and could not exactly have been more emphatic. We, I mean, we literally, I, I, I was on those conversations. We could not have been more emphatic. I mean, we essentially told them not to do the program. So I'm not, I mean. <laughs> okay, so that, that's that part. Now, now, the other part of, of our program, you know, you, you might remember doing this, you might remember not doing this, but when we hired the teachers, mm -hmm. I insisted that we hire the teachers in the exact same way that Chicago Heights would usually hire them. Because I thought about horizontal scaling. We should be able to hire 30 good teachers in Dayton and in Denver, et cetera. 
But what I didn't think about was vertical scaling. It's one thing to hire 30 good teachers. It's an altogether different thing to hire 30,000 good teachers. So our program was set up with horizontal scaling in mind, but we didn't oversample, so to speak, marginal teachers, the teachers who we would have to hire if we had to hire 20 or 30,000 to figure out the vertical scaling because we're hiring from the same labor market. And if we wanna keep the same budget, of course, we want to test whether our program is working with the kinds of teachers that we're going to be able to hire at scale. And that was sort of our own mistake that we had made because we had been thinking about the mindset of horizontal scaling. Okay, so I would say, okay, this brings up a really important point because you call that a mistake. Um, I actually take a very opposite view. So a big problem is that academic economists, all academics, have very skewed incentives. We're rewarded right. for getting academic papers published. The way you get an academic paper published is to have remarkable big results, right? You show in a very small scale study that you can transform the lives of these two or 300 kids in Chicago Heights, and that makes for a great academic paper. So actually, we've sparred in the past because my view, you know, being very, unlike you, you're motivated for social good. I'm, I'm motivated for private good. I, always, I don't care if we can scale this thing. The real problem we have is we're going to build a school and we're not going to get any results. I want to rig every single exactly. thing about this school so we get the best results possible because I'm worried we're going to get zero and zero doesn't go anywhere. And so that is a fundamental problem that, that, um, that is, you know, it just, it is, it describes the the um the incentives of academics and of course we respond to those incentives no no 100 percent. so so here's the issue is that most of the time social scientists are doing exactly what you say they're responding to the incentives of i need to get my next grant i want to get in the new york times i want my friends to talk about my huge treatment effects i want to get tenure I want to be a famous academic. So they set up efficacy tests. The problem is they write that paper up, they publish it, and they forget to tell everyone else that it was an efficacy test. Yeah. And we don't have safeguards in social sciences to say, you know what? You got to do phase one, phase two, and phase three as well, like we do in medicine, because you have jockeyed the whole thing you, you know, our very first paper that I wrote with Dana and Omar was about what are the incentives in our system and do those incentives by themselves lead to a voltage effect? They do, exactly as your intuition suggested. You lived it. I've lived it too. But you might remember at that moment, you had tenure, I had tenure, Roland had tenure. We were about, we want, of course, we want an academic paper. We want a program that works. But around every corner, we were saying, we also want to help the world, at least I was. Uh, and I know you were too. You say that you weren't, but you don't care about academic papers. Um, so I, I think you're being too hard on yourself. But, but the issue is we think about evidence-based policy and we think about producing data to give theory its best shot or my program its best shot. And we do much less of the, let's bring some of the warts of the real world back to the Petri dish and figure out, does my program work with those warts? It's what I call policy-based evidence in the paper. I mean, in, in my book, The Voltage Effect, policy-based evidence is if I can't hire great teachers- Evidence-based policy or policy-based evidence? I, I, I'm advocating policy-based evidence. Policy-based evidence. Okay, so what is, I don't even know what you're talking about. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, so typically in, in the world, we, we talk about evidence-based policy. Okay, okay, what that means is, use data to make decisions. If you talk to policymakers about what evidence-based policy means to them, if you ask 30 of them, they'll give you 25 different responses. It's like creativity or critical thinking. Everyone has a different definition of what evidence-based policy means. In the book, I advocate policy-based evidence. Okay, what does that mean? It means take the flaws from the world and bring them to the Petri dish and make sure that with those warts and flaws, your idea still works. So let's put that in action with our check program. 
in reality, we wanted to give our program a shot with a bunch of marginal teachers, not the 30 teachers we could hire and what Chicago Heights could hire, but if you want to vertically scale, you want to give it a shot with the types of teachers we will have to hire at scale. And in doing that, you then figure out, will this program or idea scale? If it doesn't, you go back to the lab, of course. Now for an academic, it's well, if it doesn't, I've just wasted $20 million on this program because I got a big zero. But if you truly want to change the world, that's the way we need to think about creating and producing evidence. Okay. And do you think that companies do a better job of this because they're incentivized by, right? They, you know, they want to scale. And in principle, they should be better, but you're, you've been involved in a lot of organizations. How do you think they do? Are companies good at this? Yes and no. So, so where they're bad is a company that is siloed. So think about a company that has 20,000 employees and they have 50,000 silos of a bunch of people working in isolation. So what that means is they have an idea. The person who has the idea tests the idea. When they test it, they might find efficacy and then they ship it. And when you ship a product, you get a bonus. So <laughs> the incentives are a little bit like in the academy in most businesses, but the where, where businesses in government are different is it's a lot easier for businesses to bring back a bad idea. So very quickly, we've had bad ideas that we try in Seattle or LA or other places. And when they don't work, we quick, we quickly bring them back. And it's usually you mean no lift, harm, no foul. When you're Lyft or, Lyft or Uber. When I'm at Lyft or Uber or working with Walmart, you, you can bring a lot of ideas back quickly. Now tipping was an idea we knew it would be hard to take back. Mm -hmm. But, but nevertheless, a lot of business ideas you can take back. In government, it's difficult because a lot of ideas are scaled. And then we don't find out for years, maybe five or 10 years, that it's not working, if we find out at all. But my qualm, my, my difficulty in this book was trying to find a lot of government programs that you could actually test whether they worked or not when they scaled. Because they roll it out in a way Typically, governments roll out programs in a way that make it nearly impossible to figure out, does it have voltage? Mm -hmm. But even when they do, five, seven, 10 years later, you find out the idea is not working. Now it's difficult to bring that back. The only time you really can is if you sunset things. So occasionally governments sunset laws that after 10 years, it automatically gets reverted. But that's rare. And in many cases, by the time it gets rolled out, you have entrenched interests. People are making what you and I call economic rents. They're, they're, they're profiting from it. And it's really hard to take that back. So I think that's the big difference. They, they all make errors and they all make the typical errors that I talk about in the first part of the book. But in one case, it's a lot easier to have a take back than in the other. One of the things I found most interesting about the book was that I think you and I share a belief that the power of economics is in the simple ideas, right? The, it, it, within the academy, economics has been completely co-opted by uh, mathematics and technicality. But but you had some of the best examples I've ever seen of how the most basic ideas of economics were not applied effectively at the firms you were, and then you were able to change it though, because like the the maybe the simplest but most powerful idea in economics is the idea of, of marginal setting marginal cost equals marginal benefit is the answer to an optimization problem. Can you tell the story about how when you got the lift, what you found in term in terms of marginal cost equals marginal benefit? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, you're exactly right. So when I think about the time that I've spent outside of the academy. You know, I worked in the White House for two years. I've worked in gov with government for a long time. You and I have worked with firms for a long time. Now as chief economist, I work obviously with firms a, a lot. Um, they make the same mistakes. And the fundamental same mistakes they make is when I'm sitting in a boardroom or a discussion, if I use economic 101 logic, in arguments, it works. It, it works because they systematically make 
the same kinds of mistakes. And, and one is thinking on the margin. So I think people make the mistake of thinking on the margin and or not thinking on the margin because of how we teach it. I mean, think about how we teach. So I've been teaching principles of economics for 25 years. I wrote a principles textbook and we typically teach it by saying, Boulder number four, <laughs> economists think on the margin. And then we give a sunk cost argument for why people should think on the margin. Like you, you buy a, uh, some concert tickets and it's raining, but you still go because you, you don't want to uh, quote, lose the money. You don't want to have this sunk cost. And then we say it's a fallacy. I don't see anything wrong with that. I have regret and I don't want to feel bad about my purchase. <laughs> but, but we don't teach them logical things like, here's what happens in the world. People get data. And when they give you data, they give you averages. So for example, at Lyft, I was sitting in a meeting where we were talking about how to spend money to recruit drivers. So they came in and said, look, we've been spending a lot of money on Facebook. And right now it costs about $500 for the last thousand drivers we got on Facebook, with Facebook ads. And then they show me some more data that says, and when we do it at Google for the last thousand drivers with Google ads, it costs about $750 per driver. And I said, can you cut those data up a little bit thinner and, and tell me what happened with the last 50 drivers rather than the last thousand? They said, well, we've never thought about that. That's trying to invoke some idea of a marginal think thinker. Now, so they came back and said, oh my gosh, you know what, the last 50, it's actually half price at Google compared to Facebook. So we, we were going to spend the new tranche of dollars with Facebook ads, but now we're going to spend it on Google ads. And in fact, if we could have a take back, the last 50, we would have moved the Facebook money to Google. So, so that's an idea that works. And then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, um, we had to figure out how to curb expenditures. And as you know, economists tend to get called into duty when there's great despair. So you remember <laughs> Sears, Sears called us when they were going bankrupt, right? They called in Steve and John, Chrysler called us when they were basically ready to go bankrupt, et cetera. So then that's when they call in the economists. So, but that's when you can make change. So COVID comes and we, we fired 22% of the workers at Lyft, cut them. One person from my team I had to cut. Okay, now Logan said, Logan Green, the founder and CEO of, of Lyft, said, we need to find ways to cut expenditures. And then I started looking at data and the data, it was very clear that around the company, we weren't spending at the point where marginal benefits equal marginal cost. So I, I wrote what I called the Adam Smith memo. <laughs> so for all of those uh, folks who don't know, Adam Smith is known as the father of economics. And he wrote uh, two great uh, treatises back in the uh, 18th century. So Adam Smith had an incredible amount of logic, but he was not very su succinct. So he would write like one idea that should be a paragraph. He would write like 500 pages on like specialization or pin factory or, or what have you. Um, my, uh, my memo was succinct and I put it in the book and it was basically a memo saying, here's how we should think on the margin. And as we curb expenditures, here's a simple rule that we can use. And that memo ended up being the most popular memo. And people would say, we have to follow Adam Smith when we <laughs> curb expenditures. And now that we're ramping back up, we're following Adam Smith. In, um, in, in terms of our expenditures. Now, now I should be honest with everyone. Uh, two days ago, I quit Lyft and, and I stepped down as a chief economist and I am now signing to be the chief economist at Walmart. So the next book will be on the economics of Walmart and, and how we've transformed Walmart. Okay, but I'll, I'll end there and throw it back to you, Steve. All right, well, John, so I tell everyone, John does not like to be unemployed. <laughs> he has had three jobs 
as chief economist <clears throat> over the last 10 years, and you have had a total of about 14 minutes unemployed in between switching jobs. I'm glad you brought that up. How you went from being the chief economist to Uber. I mean, literally, I called John up and said, hey, how's it going at Uber? He said, oh, I quit Uber yesterday. I said, oh, what are you going to do now? Oh, well, I started at Lyft. It's like, there's like literally like the moment you quit Uber and you were- no, It's true. It, it is true. So I quit on Friday. I think it was like May 18th of, um, it would have been around 2018. I, I quit Uber. Well, they, Dara knew I was quitting, but that was my last day on, on May 18th. And on May 21st, I started at Lyft. <laughs> but 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 the way that the non-compete rules work is you have to leave your brain at Uber. So I left my brain at Uber and then I brought the rest of my body to Lyft. So I had to <laughs> I, I left all of the secrets at Uber. But um, but it's really interesting the, the labor laws in California because they uh, they allow you to go, but you can't recruit your workers. Mm -hmm. So so the lawyers who I who I would talk to would say. It's fine for you to go leave your brain back at Uber, but you have to make sure you don't tamper and, and talk to any of your team at Uber uh, to try to attract them to Lyft because they take that really seriously. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a part that you really have to uh, walk a straight line on. Have you thought, I mean, so Walmart has to go down as one of the great scaling exercises wow. in the history of mankind. Have you thought you know anything about that? Uh, we've never talked about it. Little, it's just, yeah. I remember, I mean, we were kind of young when it happened, but my God, I mean, they, they, I think they did all the things in your book and they did them incredibly well. No, I think you're right. I think you're 100% right. So the one part where it, it's clear is that I can still remember as a kid, I would go down to the Ben Franklin and I would have to pay 50 cents for a pack of baseball cards. And when Walmart came in, I could go to Walmart and get each pack of baseball cards for a quarter. And, and Walmart ended up understanding scale on the supply side very quickly. And they also understood the, how big of a slice of the pie that they can get in, in a very quick way, which is vital sign one and then vital sign number five in the book. But, but I think Walmart, when I talk to people there and talk about old Sam, and, and what happened there, I think it was a little bit like the billiards player who looks like they know physics, but it just so happened that they got enough practice in that they honed it and, and it worked well. So, you know, one of the rules in the book is unique humans don't scale. And I, I talked to a lot of people who are human centric and they say, well, well, look, John, we've scaled like an early childhood program that has to use individuals to visit homes. They say, look, we've scaled. And then when we dig into what they have, they've gone back and forth from the lab and they've scaled with the types of people who they can hire. Mm -hmm. And it ends up that as they scaled, there are a lot of humans who could end up doing the curriculum as it is written in the end. So it's worked because they're not scaling with unique humans. They're scaling with humans who they can actually purchase in the labor market. And what that means is, of course, hire them. So the Harlem Children's Zone is a great example. So Jeffrey Canada, who I don't know if you know him, but he's an amazing man. Like, like so inspirational, so great. Built the Harlem Children's Zone. And then in the Obama administration, they decided they were going to take that program and make it nationwide. Okay, And someone we know well was being charged with like, I don't know, like a, an eight billion dollar budget to do this, and um, and I said to him, "Hey, why didn't why didn't they have Jeff Canada do this?" And and he said, "Well, because Jeff Canada said I couldn't even replicate the Harlem Children's Zone myself if I had to start a new one. How like I wouldn't think it's time to start twenty of them." And it was really interesting. And I said, I said to our friend, who I'm going to say and leave names upon. I said, "Well, are you crazy?" You're going to take the job when Jeff Canada has just said he couldn't do it over. What an, and to, to the government's great credit, they ended up never spending the money. I mean, I think, yeah. but look, that would have been that that would, that would have been like chapter three of your book. That would have been the like the bulk of chapter three if they had actually done it because that that was a program that was guaranteed to fail. You didn't have to spend a penny of the eight billion dollars to know it was going to fail. 
No, I'm so glad you brought that up because it, it really highlights exactly what you're saying in chapter three. It's titled, is it the chef or is it the ingredients? And, and when you look at the restaurant space, some restaurants scale remarkably well and some fail almost immediately. And it's, it's a nice lesson because if your initial success in your restaurant was a famous chef, and we all know that if you're famous, if you're unique, the definition of being unique is there are a few others like you. But the other side of it that people oftentimes get wrong is they think they can teach. And you, you think, and you're persuaded that, well, I know the secret sauce, I know how to do it so I can teach it. And it's remarkably hard, if not impossible, to teach an ordinary human to be remarkable. So when you have these restaurants that scale quickly, I talk about Jamie's in, in London and there, there are all kinds of examples, but the ones that are based on the unique chef, they fail every time. The ones that are based on, think about Domino's, sausage or pepperoni or, or the sauce or the cheese or the crust, whatever, if, you're, if your initial success is based on something you can replicate at scale, Jeffrey Canada can't be replicated. And when the secret sauce that he had could not be replicated, it will fail every time. And with the, with the ingredients that can be replicated, it works. And it's sort of a, a set of simple lessons in the front end of the book that I think after you read them, you say, this is common sense. But when I talk to VCs and policymakers and firms, there's always one, two or three or four of them that are surprises to them. And they say, you know, I've never really thought about the problem that way. And I like to think of the front side of the book as giving a checklist. So if you're interested in scaling, you should double check these five features. And maybe, maybe like think about my dad and brother and grandpa, uh, one man, one truck, one good life. Um, it, it, it's fine. They understand they can't scale. So I don't want people to read the book and say, well, this is just for Amazon and Uber and Lyft. And it's for those people who want to explode and take over the world. It's not. The idea is figure out how scalable what you want to do actually is. And if you're happy with that, then you invest appropriately. Mm -hmm. But there are so many cases where people are overly optimistic, they exaggerate how big they can be, and they throw a bunch of money at things that just have no chance, and they would never pass the five vital signs in the book. So it, it's more to me is a sense of, um, here's what I have, and if I'm happy with it, scale it. If I'm not, go back to the lab and change some things, mm -hmm. and change it until you get to a point where you're happy with what you have. Going back to Walmart, so I remember when Walmart entered Europe and I thought, well, Walmart, man, they're the best and they're going to destroy Europe. And because their competition was like Aldi and anyone who's American knows how crappy Aldi is. Walmart left, they, they went they put their tail between their legs and they came back. And what was interesting to me, and I know what you're taking is, I think Walmart got confused about what they were good at. And, um, and they had never, they'd always done the same thing. Like you said, they'd done it really well. And in Europe, they actually had to do something different. And they just were, they just got destroyed. No, I think that's right. So, so I was just talking the other day about, about the foreign markets, and I'm going to be responsible for some of the foreign markets, in particular Asia, Canada, and Latin America. Um, but it, it's true that when you think about everyday low pricing, and it's what everyday low pricing means to consumers and how they were able to break into new markets with the supply side, the, the logistics of it. And then advertising is we're EDLP, we're everyday low pricing and put the stuff on the shelves and it's going to be, be purchased. That didn't work in Europe and it doesn't work in other cultures either. And, and you're right, that that's a point in in case for, for kind of chapter number two in the book about understand the slice of the pie and the situation that you're selling into. And if it doesn't work, they would have been much better served emulating something else that looks like it worked 
through the consumer's eyes and then on the back end doing the supply chain stuff that they were so good at early. And if yeah. they would have done that, now now they have it, but they never switched the front end in, in a manner in which they should have. All right, so let me ask you something. This is unrelated to your book. I'm just curious. The COVID response in the U.S., the government's COVID response, governments, I mean, actually local, struck me as pretty much awful, um, <laughs> with maybe the possible exception, the clear exception of the vaccines, which were well, yeah. enormous. But, but other than that, from beginning to end, it's a disaster. Do you, do you see the lens you're looking through in the book as being relevant to why policy failed so badly? I, I think so. I think so. So, so it's it's useful to juxtapose COVID with, let's say, polio vaccinations. So, polio vaccinations. Of course, Salk has an idea. So he does some experiments with his own kids. Right. It's a bit like you and I and other scientists, where we start is with our own kids. He finds it works. And then what he finds is it's not a false positive. He finds that polio vaccination really works over and over again. And then he finds out that it works for all kids. So so he's he's figured out the market. We we did the same thing with COVID. COVID seems to work for everyone. Now, vital sign number three is the situation. And here is where COVID and the polio vaccination dramatically departs. So we did something brilliant with the polio vaccinations in that, Steve, you just had a child. You know what happens. You have a lot of kids just like I do. You have a child comes out. Everyone says, congratulations. They whisk it away. They check it out and then get some vaccination, some shots. Six months later, you bring the child back for its checkup. We all do that because we want to do well by our child, gets more vaccinations. At the 12 month mark, more. And during that cycle, what we've done is we've made it really easy and really low cost to actually get the vaccinations because we've leveraged the healthcare system. And we've done it within the healthcare system. Okay. So Plan A, we haven't done that with COVID. And then plan B, it became politicized. So it became very different than the polio vaccination in that people weren't sure if it was the right thing to do. And is it appropriate? With the polio vaccination, everyone agreed from the start, it's the right thing to do. You need to do that for your child. So now that's where we're stuck. It's hard to get it. It's politicized. So even if it was easy to get, a lot of people would say no. But if you do, if you would have it as part of the system, I think it would help a little bit. Okay, so let's go for Let's go beyond. So the vaccine is a relative success, okay? I mean, it's a huge success compared to what I would say are complete, I would say we are still walking around in a complete haze about when are people contagious and how close or far should you stand away and which masks are good or bad and what should the mandates be? Would you not say, I mean, your book is all about generating evidence and the power of randomized trials. Do you think that, I don't want to blame it all on, uh, partly it's on epidemiologists, part, part of it's on medical ethics, but don't you think that we've done an incredibly bad job of getting baseline knowledge about the facts that are relevant to fighting a pandemic. Like we didn't treat it like a war. Like you, you could imagine we would have declared war on COVID and we would have a general and, and they're leading the charge and we would have had some volunteers, maybe people from the army who we might have, you know, given COVID to, to try and understand when they are not contagious. <laughs> you think, why, why were you, no, you're, I, you, you can't think that's a bad idea, can you? Oh, oh, oh I, I was with you until you said you wanted to start giving people COVID. I do. Um, because, and, and because giving the them, I know that we've done that in the past. Let, let's be clear. But, but that's where I was with you until that point. So, yeah. okay. so, so I agree. About that. I, I agree. Up until that point, you're right. But I, I think it's, it's also behavioral scientists like you and me and, and how, how we can think about using nudges, like what Dick talks about all the time. And, and on the other side, of course, we, we dialed it in with the vaccination, right? That That's an A plus. I think you and I can both agree with that. But the fact about masks and how we should think about incentivizing people and and how we should think about spacing people and, 
in space and time, let's say, and, and what that leads to in terms of in infection rates. I, I agree with that. Now, because one thing we haven't talked about is the power. I mean, you believe in the power of, of randomization for learning causality. And I think that's that's where it's interesting that we have just been completely and totally afraid to do anything like randomization around many of the, the spaces in which COVID we could learn so much. And, and I would say, look, you know, millions of people are dying. You, the value of getting this information is almost infinite. We could pay volunteers a million dollars a piece to participate in, 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 in experiments where you'd get like half the US population lining up to want to be in the experiment at the price you're offering. And it just kind of makes me mad that the ethicists have taken control of this issue until we don't even think about those kind of creative approaches. I'm with you, but it's it's more than just COVID. Uh, so I, I just wrote this op-ed around why governments don't use more randomized controlled trials. So it, it's it's actually everything, and they tend to argue that we don't do it because it's not fair. Mm -hmm. and, and they say it's not fair because some people are getting it, whereas others are not. And, and this is the disconnect in my mind, because think about what happens in drug trials. In drug trials, it's almost much, much worse in many ways than what you and I do. Because what they do is they say, okay, you're gonna get a pill. And they don't tell you whether it was the sugar pill or the good pill. But people say it's okay because it's informed consent. Whereas like think about Chicago Heights. The people who were in our control group, we didn't tell them, by the way, you're getting the program and then not really <laughs> give them the program. Because we said, we don't want to do that to kids. No, even what we did, some people have issues with. Because they say, if you're going into a poor community to help them, why aren't you giving everyone the program if you think it works? And then we back off and say, well, we one, we want to make sure to test it because we're not sure what works, just like they do in drug trials. But then they still argue that. And I think it's a fundamental disconnect in a lot of people's minds. And they think about fairness in terms of an intragenerational argument. People who are living right now, they get it or they don't get it. And that's what's in their minds unfair. But what they don't think about is every day that goes by that we don't figure out which early childhood program works, which incentive program works to get people to wear masks, et cetera, et cetera. That's one more day that future generations will not have a solution. So the moment you start talking about intergenerational fairness, I think all of these fairness arguments become moot in large part because just exactly as you're saying, so many people can be helped by the information and the knowledge that we learn from the experimental method in the field and in social sciences. But that's a fundamental disconnect that many government policymakers have. And even when I run experiments with firms, a lot of times people get queasy if you do these experiments without people knowing that they're taking part in it. And I always take the stand that, well, everyone's going to be better off from being part of this experiment. And then that's when people get more excited about it. But think about, Steve, if we were actually giving people a bogus thing for their kid and saying, use this bogus thing for two years, and then at the end, we tell you, yeah, you really got the sugar pill. Congratulations. <laughs> we would be put out of business, right? Sure. But, but after 1963, we, we start to do that in, uh, in the medical field, and, and it's okay. Uh, John and Steve, I have a feeling that, um, you know, you two could go for quite some time. There, you've only been gotten scratching the surface, not only of the book, but of course, all of your shared interests and shared uh, topics. So um, it's been fascinating listening to the back and forth. Uh, John, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us with FAN and agreeing to be a great conversation partner with John. I want to remind everyone, uh, there's been some great questions submitted both in advance and during the event. Come, we've been putting in links in chat to buy a copy of The Voltage Effect. There's so much in there that uh, will be really helpful to a lot of folks. 
buy a copy, come join us at After Hours and continue this conversation with John and Steve. Steve may have to, as you just heard, he has a brand new baby at home, so he may have to not stay for the whole thing, just maybe stay for a few minutes, but he will at least uh, make it an appearance. So uh, come join us. So I'm gonna, we have, we're short on time, we're at 7.56. Um, I'm going to go with a question that's uh, kind of, uh, of course, of high interest to what we'll call us regular folks here. And it's from Karen. And she says, um, would you explain the idea that with the right set of incentives applied at scale, um, that you can do things like boost voter turnout and increase clean energy use? And then she asked specifically, what type of incentives would increase voter turnout? Yeah. Oh, great question. Thanks. So that was something that I worked on in the last two presidential elections. And the idea that the best idea that we found that worked is if you tell somebody the Saturday before the Tuesday vote. So if you go to houses and say, just to let you know, we're doing surveys on voting and we will, we will be back next Saturday to talk about the election and whether you voted. So that in and of itself is a huge boost for people because they, some of them will vote, some of them don't want to vote, but the fact that you will be coming back and talking about it, that ends up leading them to say, well, look, they're gonna come back and talk to me. So I can either not vote and lie and then what economists call it is you get a disutility from lying. You pay a moral price. And, and we actually estimated something like $4.57 for each lie in this paper that we, that we run this big field experiment. Um, or you can go ahead and vote. And what we find is that's a, it's a reasonably sized effect that, that's consistent with a lot of the largest effects that political scientists find in the get out to vote. So. So, so that's one way is just tell them that after the election, we're going to talk about it. Now, you, you're, you also coupled um, energy conservation. And, and what we find in that work is to get somebody to adopt a new technology that saves energy for the very first time, social norms play a huge role. And what am I talking about with social norms? Saying something like, seven out of 10 households in your neighborhood already have that technology. Right. That is very effective to get people to buy for the first time. Now, if you want them to buy, make deeper purchases, prices matter much more than social norms. So this is a great example where standard economics still works, prices matter, lower price, more people will buy. But if you combine it with psychology and behavioral economics, you can get a much bigger impact at scale. So thanks for those two questions. Those were excellent. We just hosted a couple of weeks ago, we just hosted uh, Robert Frank from Cornell uh, in his work, of course, on behavioral contagion. And he was interviewed by David Wallace Wells. And one of the topics, of course, that they were talking about was uh, solar panels on houses and neighborhoods and how the, the, the contagion effect, like one house, then two houses, then four houses. And it's just, it, it's remarkable. So uh, I hear you on this, Pete. Go ahead. You want, and you no, have, no, I'm glad you brought you that like, up. Yeah, 30 it. seconds. Go ahead. Yeah. I hope Bob isn't on here tonight because yeah. Bob is one of those schools that I ended up saying no to when I went to the University <laughs> of Chicago. And Bob is one of the nicest guys in the world. I, I yes. went out to his house on the, on the river and Aww. his son played nice guitar music. Aww. We had a beautiful dinner. So Bob well, uh, is just a salt of the earth. Well, Wonderful. I have a feeling that uh, our after hours guests will uh, enjoy more of these stories. We want to hear about the other schools that courted you. And as a, a <laughs> Chicago alum, I'm glad you picked Chicago. So uh, good news on that. So everybody come to after hours. There's lots more stories. I'm going to um, put the twist on John's arm. I want to hear about philanthropy and how to have people give you cash. So uh, I want to know more about that. So thank you so much, Steve and John. We'll see you in about five minutes. 